Those closest to him called him Eta. To the world, he was Lazarus Salih, second president of the Republic of Palau. He presided over what may be the most turbulent and corrupt period in Palauan history. He will be remembered as Palau's second president and the second Palauan president to die a violent death in office. The official report calls Salih's shooting self-inflicted. His predecessor, Palau's first president, Haruo Remalik, was assassinated in 1985. His killers have yet to be prosecuted. The terms of both men were dominated by one overriding issue, Palau's relationship with the United States. Both men backed a compact of free association, an arrangement trading parts of Palau's land, ocean, and sovereignty for U.S. financial aid. Both men tried to win sufficient Palauan voter approval for the compact. Both failed. Now, within three years of each other, both are dead. I tried to encourage Interior to do the job that they are still responsible for doing. When they resisted, I asked whether lives had to be lost to get them to act. I regret that my question turned out to be a prediction of the future. To be frank, I also didn't quite believe many of the allegations of wrongdoing in Palau that we were told at the hearing. But I was concerned enough about what we were being told to ask federal law enforcement agencies for reports. I directed the staff to find out the truth. What the staff of this committee found was that compact supporters were, be were behind the violence. And that they had used government resources to intimidate compact opponents to deny them access to the courts, to deny them their rights under Palauan law. The most important uh, thing is that we go ahead and get democracy operating in these islands and these territories. And this includes respect for the rule of law and access for all Palauans to their judicial system, no matter how sensitive, controversial, or unpopular. This report looks at the impact American values and U.S. policies are having on the emerging Pacific democracy of Palau. A living culture from before the time of Christ. A nation born of the sea, wedded to the land.
people governed by consensus. Once, a society of complementary forces held in creative balance. Now, Palau is a country in the throes of transition. But to what? September 15th, 1944. United States Marines hit the beaches of Control of Palau passed to the U.S. in World War II when GIs took it from the Japanese, who had taken it from the Germans, who had taken it from the Spanish, who had taken it from the Palauans in the first place. The meeting is open. After the war, under U.N. auspices, Palau and the rest of Micronesia became an American strategic trust territory, moving the western boundary of America to within a few hundred miles of the Asian mainland. Washington now governed an area of the Pacific as large as the U.S. itself. Under U.S. control, part of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, became until the 60s ground zero for a series of 66 American nuclear blasts. Confronted with American might and promises, trusting islanders gave up their ancestral homelands. An ancient island people watched as their culture, lands, and genetic heritage were damaged beyond repair or compensation. The nuclear fallout didn't reach Palau, but the political fallout did. When, in 1979, Palauans had a chance to write a constitution of their own, the nuclear destruction of Japan and the Marshalls was still fresh in their minds. Palauans had been taught American democratic ideals, and they took them seriously. The form of Palau's constitution was modeled on that of the U.S., but the content is uniquely Palauan. The wisdom distilled from 2,000 years of culture has been forged into a 20th century document defining Palau as a modern nation. In the Constitution, Palauan's ancient love for the sea and land are given the force of law. Palauans had announced their sovereignty, their right to manage their lands, ocean, and lives. What made this constitution world famous was that it sought to protect Palau from all the poisonous weapons of the modern world. True to their tradition of rule by consensus, Palauan voters passed their constitution by 92%. They were serious about the toxic weapons ban. To lift it, said the constitution, would take 75% majority approval. At no point in these internal U.S. government discussions did anyone say those guys have to change the Constitution because there was an alternative. The alternative was if they didn't change the Constitution, we wouldn't negotiate free association. 
we had an obligation to respect their desire to adopt whatever constitution they wished. And that was fundamental to our approach. We did not have an obligation to negotiate free association with them. That was a matter of mutual choice. Forced to vote twice more on the question, Palauans were no more willing to change their constitution to please a foreign government than Americans themselves would be. They were practicing, they said, what Americans preached, democratic choice. They pointed to the UN Charter, to its guarantees of their rights to independence and self-determination. Still, Washington refused to take no for an answer. There were three topics which remained unresolved. Uh, the first of them was an effort by the framers of the Constitution to claim broad areas of what we regarded as the open sea uh, as territorial waters of Palau. Palau's constitution, in keeping with the international law of the sea, claims territorial waters within a 200-mile limit. But the compact, in effect, shrinks Palau's boundaries to only 12 miles from shore, cutting the island nation off from its basic ocean resources. The Law of the Sea Treaty provides, uh, which was signed in 1982, was that countries uh, have what is called an economic um, resource zone uh, of about 200 miles uh, from, uh, you know, offshore. And the United States um, trying to, uh, to ignore that or trying to limit uh, Palau's um, boundaries to just 12 miles uh, is basically at heart fundamentally a denial uh, or an attempt to foreclose um, uh, a claim by Palau to be sovereign. That's what uh, this, this amounts to because sovereign countries uh, in fact are entitled to 200 miles. And the United States has done this partly because the United States is not a signatory to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And it just makes it that much more easy for the United States to do what it wants to do. And in this particular case, with respect to the, to the maritime boundaries, the big issue here is the, de the unfettered deployment of the nuclear navy. Palau's constitution says Palau's government cannot acquire private land on behalf of a foreign government. But the compact gives the U.S. military the right to demand and get whatever Palauan land it wants within a matter of days. Since it was fundamental to the entire concept of free association that at some later point the United States might require for its defense purposes some uh, land in Palau, it appeared to us that a prohibition against the exercise of the right of eminent domain on behalf of the United States government would undermine the efforts that we were making to achieve agreement on, on uh, free association. It's the best provision we can get. Uh, we know where the United States intends to use the land. We know how much they... And it's, it, they, it hasn't really remained. I mean, the requirements have not uh, changed over the years. The native people, indigenous people of this country, the Great Turtle Island, alias the United States of America, have well over 360 trees with the United States government, none of which are honored at this point in time. The treaties have allowed the Europeans to come in uh, and take over more and more land. They continue doing this without any, any regard for the treaties that they have made. They have, uh, within the treaties, it says, this land will always be yours. And, but then when they find gold, or they find coal, or they find uranium, then it, it becomes what they call a national sacrifice area. It's simple mathematics. We got no money. And that's what I'm afraid. My wife is from Cleveland. I can go back to Cleveland with her. I can pump gas, okay? But what about these people here? Where are they going to go? This is it for them. And I love this place. I'm not going to move to Cleveland. That's a beautiful city, but it, I don't think they have a clean air for me. But the point is, we got no other place to go. The people in Cleveland can move to California. 
okay? But we don't move anywhere. This is it. And we got no more money. We cannot get the hell out of here. What are you going to do? Being a woman, you give birth, and you know how hard giving birth is, and you know how hard life is, and you want to keep your land and your culture intact for your kids. I believe the Palauans are on the brink of discovering that their land policies um, may be influenced a great deal by a large nation like the United States and that they no longer would be the owners of Palau but may give up the right to their homeland. We have today in Hawaii the example of that kind of um, land tenure system that's changed drastically. We no longer are the keepers of our land and I, uh, I am very afraid for Palauans and the land's tenure system is theirs right now. Tomorrow, it may not be. In fact, I would say that the whole compact of free association that's being pushed down the throats of people in the Marshalls, in the Federated States of Micronesia and Palau, is really uh, an attempt or one of, the fine, one of the stages in the annexation of Micronesia to become formally a part of the U.S. body politic. Uh, what we see being done, in fact, is one of the um, greatest colonial land grabs uh, in current history. From Guam and American Samoa in the Pacific to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands in the Caribbean, island people share an ambiguous relation to Washington. Neither states nor nations they trade their sovereignty for the promise of protection. Our forward peacetime presence is represented by over 110,000 Navy and Marine Corps men and women serving in battle groups and battle forces, amphibious ready groups, submarine patrols, and other fleet deployments. This forward naval presence extends from Central America to West Africa, from the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean, from the Sea of Japan throughout the Pacific. A visible reminder of America's commitment to our allies. There is a third problem, and perhaps some would say the most serious, that this constitutional provision raises. If we permit, inferentially or explicitly, a breach in our policy of neither confirming nor denying the presence of nuclear weapons in a given location. If we permit that policy to be breached in the case of Palau, then we are on a, hate to use it, slippery slope. Because there are lots of other places in the world where we have military bases or where our aircraft or ships travel, where the people in whose territory we're operating would love to have us say we are not going to bring in nuclear weapons. And if we agree to it once, so the feeling of many successive American administrations has been, if we agree to it in one place, we cannot resist having that done to us elsewhere. And there are many other places in all parts of the world where we would then be faced with a serious problem. We have, of course, seen it subsequent to Palau, we've seen it erupt in New Zealand. That's what our problem with New Zealand is. We have not given comfort to the Soviet bloc. We have not undermined the West. But the result has been that we have been told by some officials in the United States administration that our decision is not, as they put it, to be cast free. We are actually told that New Zealanders cannot decide for themselves how to defend New Zealand but are obliged to adopt the methods which others use to defend themselves. To compel an ally to accept nuclear weapons against the wishes of that ally is to take the moral position of totalitarianism which allows for no self-determination and which is exactly the evil that we're supposed to be fighting against. <laughs> With advances in methods of destruction came advances in technologies of communication. 
more and more peoples are linked and informed worldwide. With increased awareness of the consequences, Pacific nations are no longer unquestioning hosts to the superpower militaries. Precisely because in reaction to the U.S. military buildup, uh, precisely in reaction to the sort of aggressive maritime strategy that has been pushed by the Reagan administration, um, the mood or the feelings or the drive for demilitarization and denuclearization have been increasing throughout the Pacific. And um, the example of the uh, Republic of Palau and its voting for a nuclear-free constitution uh, has proved to be quite significant. Palau is no longer alone. Since its constitution's passage, 16 million American voters have made more than 153 U.S. cities and counties nuclear-free zones. Worldwide, there are now 4,000. Already, 15% of the Earth's people live in nuclear-free zones covering a quarter of the planet. Today, I stand with the people of Balao, those supporting a nuclear-free Pacific, with all those supporting a nuclear-free Europe. We must make this a nuclear-free Earth and give peace a chance. Hard negotiations, mutually verifiable, deep cuts, and own elimination. We must choose mutual existence over mutual annihilation. That's the thrust of our future and our leadership. Lazarus Salih was Palau's chief compact negotiator. First as ambassador, then as president, he attempted to engineer compact passage with an increasingly heavy hand. So heavy, in fact, that the Palau legislature asked the international human rights community to send election observers. When I was uh, observing the, the, the voting, I uh, talked to an old woman and uh, she wanted to give a statement. And so she said, uh, um, Palau is, is, is like a sea and we have big fish and we have small fish. The very small fish, that's the people. And when they go in groups, they, they are uh, a little bit stronger and they are committees. And then there are a little bit bigger fish and that's the, uh, the government uh, employees and their advisors. And then there's a very big fish and that's the president. He chases all of them. And then there, but then there's a much, much bigger fish and that's President Reagan because he chases all of us. And then they said, she said, there's a, and there's also a big white bird flying high up in the air. It's flying so high that it can't see anything and it can't hear anything. And that's the United Nations. Won't you please ask them, she said, to look at us, to take care and to see that we have a crisis with the United States and that we should not be alone in that crisis. I think it's uh, important we're here because I really think that lady is right. They don't see much. At least one eye is blind. Despite unresolved bottom line concerns, Palauans have been made to vote on the compact six times since 1983. After each vote, Palauan Compact supporters and U.S. officials have claimed victory for the compact and Congress has moved forward. Let me introduce as our first speaker, Ambassador Zeter. Who I was reminded of a story as I came in here about a fellow that was uh, seeing a psychiatrist. And the fellow is, you know, very happy and everything seemed to be fine. And the psychiatrist was trying to get down to what his problems were and so forth, and he finally started to ask him about his marriage, and he said, yes, he said, I'm married, he said, I'm married, and he said, how, how often uh, do you have marital relations? And the fellow said, once a year, once a year, and he said, you, you, you seem very happy about that. 
And he says, I am, I am. And he said, well, why are you so happy? He said, Be because tonight's the night. <laughs> now, tonight's the night. We just got word five minutes ago that the Compact of Free Association was passed by the Congress of the United States for Palau. Now, that's right up to the minute. <laughs> Constitutionalist attorneys have carried their fight to the courtroom. Each time, Palau's Supreme Court, under Chief Justice Nakamura, has upheld the Constitution. One key decision was made by Associate Justice Gibson. I felt that it was patent that the intent of the Con Con delegates was to make it well nigh impossible to, as a plaintiff say, override the Constitution. And that goes back to this question of can we get a 75% vote. Each and every source to which I turned for help in endeavoring to find validity of the compact confirmed a contrary intent and the further unarguable conclusion that it was the intention of the delegates to make within the limits of their capabilities Palau forever nuclear free. With each successive election, Palau and doubt about the process has grown. Many people are wondering if you, uh, this is a democratic system that uh, the government is doing. And of course we know that it is not. But the older people who really don't know what is going on, don't know a, a democratic system, are saying, is this an American system, a way of uh, government? Is this a democratic system? American is? Is this an American way? Why the pressure from Washington? Back in 1986, Congressman Stephen Solars, chairman of the House Asia Pacific Affairs Subcommittee, explained it this way. Well, in terms of the uh, nuclear testing uh, question at, at Kwajalein, which is uh, one of our most important missile testing ranges in the world, uh, our lease on the Kwajalein missile testing range expires, uh, uh, I think, at the end of uh, October. And uh, if we haven't implemented the Compact of Free Association with the Marshall Islands at that time, because Kwajalein is within the jurisdiction of the Marshall uh, Islands, uh, we would then have to renegotiate the agreement. In the meantime, uh, some of the residents of the area might take matters into their own hands. Uh, I'm informed that uh, several months ago when we failed to implement the compact in a timely fashion, it ultimately cost us $100 million or more in terms of costs we had to sustain as a result of the necessity of postponing tests that otherwise would have been conducted. In terms of the problem of the uh, victims of our actual nuclear testing as distinguished from missile testing uh, in the Marshall Islands back in the 1950s, in effect what you have in the compact through the establishment of the trust fund is a settlement out of court of the claims of the Marshall Islanders against the United States. Now, if the compact is not implemented, the matter will then proceed in the courts. And it is theoretically possible that the courts might find in favor of the Marshall Islanders who have filed suit. And potentially, this could cost the United States government uh, billions of dollars. And to the tune of Old Lang Syne, the flag of the trust territories was lowered. The potential billions in lawsuits and land rights costs led the U.S. to stage an elaborate ceremonial end to a trusteeship that in the eyes of the international community was still in force. High Commissioner. McCoy's most precious gift of the day was the flag of the trust territories. She held it in her arms like an old friend whose time had come to pass away. But I'm sad because I'm leaving, just real sad. But I'm happy because you're a full-fledged commonwealth. We did it. It's done. You're on your own, and you're a wonderful addition to the United States of America. 
High Commissioner Janet McCoy led an entourage on what was billed as a farewell tour to three of Micronesia's four new countries, but not to Palau. ...when an entourage of government officials flew through Micronesia to officially end the trusteeship. There have been some, some upsetting times, there have been some bad times, the, the assassination of President Remelik, uh, the cholera epidemic, those are some of the, the sad times and and the hard times that we had out here. But by and large, um, I think things have progressed along nicely, and um, I'm ex very pleased and happy that we're in the position where we are now. But the trusteeship was not over, and a key reason was that problems in Palau were deepening. One of them was Zipsico, a power plant scheme far beyond Palau's needs and its budget. With Ipsico, the door to government corruption had opened. The subcommittee will uh, come to order. Uh, Mr. President, uh, you are, uh, I'm sure, aware of the article in the San Jose Mercury News, which stated that you uh, and some others, one of whom I think was your brother, had re received a large payment from Ipseco. This dubious deal, encouraged by key with, U.S. Uh, officials, dragged Palau project. into a national wow. debt larger than Can all the development aid if, promised uh, in the this compact. Is correct, and if it is, could you describe the circumstances uh, under which these payments were made and for what purpose they were given and what you were expected to do in exchange for them? Right. How much was the payment? It was 100000 right. And your brother, did he receive a payment also? I've seen the article since coming here, and and uh, I believe he did. I I do not know, sir. It was a check made out. Yeah. For a hundred thousand. Yes. To you or to the travel agency? It was made to my name. Uh, and there was no written contract. No. Is that usually how people do business in Palau? It's not uncommon in. In my experience in Palau. The hearing will come to order. Two months ago, the President transmitted to Congress the certification that the Compact of Free Association had been approved in accordance with the Palau Constitution. And that the United States will, will be a desperate Salih administration needed compact money to pay its debts. It pressured Palau's voters to amend their constitution so that nuclear ban could be lifted and the compact passed by a simple majority, not 75 percent. Women elders who challenged this tactic in court were terrorized. If this is true, then today I would like to get the cooperation of both Palauan and United States officials in reassuring those access to the courts that they will be safe from intimidation. I have been insulted by a variety of recent questions about whether the intimid intimidations were real, was real. Shots were fired outside Rafaela Sumang's house. That same evening, she was visited by a striker who said that if she did not withdraw the lawsuit, worse things would happen to her. The following night, Bedor was murdered. The same night that Bedor was murdered, a firebomb was ignited on my land, blowing up in the rear of my house, sometimes between 10.30 and 11, after the government turned the power off in all of Palau. What, what would you have this committee do? What do you think we should do? What uh, our group wants your committee to work on is that to keep the Congress from ratifying the Compact of Free Association until we resolve the internal court process. Well, but a suit hasn't been filed yet. We will. Or it was, uh, I just told you that we will definitely would uh, file a lawsuit. And when will that be done? What's the hurry? <laughs> it's our future. The women elders did refile their lawsuit. They and other Palauans called on Congress and the United Nations to respect Palauan rights and sovereignty.
I declare open the 55th session of the Trusteeship Council. We have already had a very bitter experience of destruction of our peace by the compact process. In August 1987, I became the lead plaintiff in a lawsuit brought by more than 20 women challenging the attempt to amend our Constitution and then pass the compact. We, persist, we persisted in the lawsuit until a ser series of violent acts culminating in the murder of Mr. Bedor Bins on the evening before a public court hearing in which our arguments were to be heard led us to drop the lawsuit. The most significant events in the period under review and in more recent months demonstrate clearly Palau's continued progress along the path of self-determination and the continued vibrancy of its democratic institutions of self-government. Alarmingly, the most recent Trusteeship Council mission to the August 21st Compact of Free Association vote that followed the amendment vote mandated the observers only to observe the polling and vote count. There was no direction given to observe the campaign in spite of the council's knowledge of the coercion of some voters and an ethnic minority group and the intimidation of some members of the judiciary. The previous August 4th vote on the constitutional amendment took place without any United Nations observation. Mr. President and distinguished members, given the recent and serious developments in Palau, future observer missions must receive a much broader mandate so that the wishes of the Palauan people can truly be fulfilled. In particular, we would like to extend our best regards to all members and staff of the visiting missions who worked so tirelessly to ensure that the exercises in democracy in Palau were carefully and accurately observed and evaluated for the Council's deliberations. Their reports speak for themselves. However, let me state now that we are cognizant of their uniform conclusions that the plebiscites in Palau were all conducted fairly and freely and did, in fact, reflect the will of the people in each case, contrary to some published statements. It is not the purpose or the mandate of the International Commission of Jurists to inquire into political questions. Our sole concern is the question of constitutional law, the supremacy of law, the supremacy of a constitution. Attorney William Butler led an international of team of distinguished judges to investigate charges that the rule of law in Palau citizens. had broken down. But here we found that there was a strong judiciary and although it had been intimidated and threatened, it still had the guts uh, to take positions if and when it could get cases before it. The problem was that the society, uh, through all this violence and intimidation, uh, threatened the individual plaintiffs so that they were scared to death to bring a lawsuit. We Palauans should not have to accept the U.S. military in our islands in order to have self-determination. Certain sections of the compact deal with security and defense. But this is the security and defense of the United States, not the balance. Our land and our waters are our security. The compact poses a grave threat to the livelihoods of the Balan people. We urge the United Nations to study whether the compact meets the United Nations standard for decolonization. We want to know about all of our options for political status not just free association. I urge you to take no action on termination of the trusteeship until the United States, as administering authority, fulfills its obligations to help Palau achieve self-reliance or independence. Palauans were not the only Micronesians to petition for continued United Nations oversight of U.S. policies in the trust territory. As we appear here today, the trusteeship is not terminated. It cannot be unilaterally terminated by the administering authority. It appears that there was a secret agenda to wait until the United Nations oversight was over and then strip the Northern Mariana Islands of self-government. 
the Northern Mariana Islands is no longer a commonwealth, but rather a mere colony which is run from top to bottom by the administering authority. And what we sacrifice to get into this unique relationship with the administering authority is giving our land away to them for their strategic interests. The legal position of the United States and its Department of Justice then is that the Northern Mariana Islands and its people are mere items of property that can be governed by any rule or regulation which Congress deems appropriate. So, Mr. President and honorable members of the Trusteeship Council, you can see why we are here. In desperation, we petition this eminent body for relief. Chair, sure, I'd like to welcome all of you here uh, this morning for <clears throat> this very important uh, hearing on legislation that uh, deals with Palau. Congressman Morris Udall and Ron DeLugo had spearheaded a congressional probe of the situation in Palau. I directed the staff to find out the truth. What the staff of this committee found was that compact supporters were, be were behind the violence. And that they had used government resources to intimidate compact opponents to deny them access to the courts, to deny them their rights under Palawan law. For us Palawans in the, in, on a small island surrounded by waters, it is like hanging on to a very teeny uh, driftwood in the open ocean with sharks. Uh, swimming around you and it would be a moment before they, 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 they kill you. Although I'm, I'm trying to, to, to relate to you how it feels, I, I cannot adequately tell you how it really feels. I, I understand perfectly. There's no way that in words you can, you can convey to another person yes. the fear and the helplessness that you feel when you cannot turn to those bodies that we take for granted here in this country. Most importantly, the courts. Uh, at first I thought that this was a local political uh, issue, that this was a local politics, that many of the things that you were saying were exaggerated. Unfortunately, and to my sorrow, the investigating uh, investigations of this, this committee have uh, borne out all that you said. And I want to commend you for standing up for your people at the risk of your own life. And uh, if no one else, uh, this member of Congress uh, stands in great admiration of you because we all wonder how we would perform under that kind of pressure for our people. We've got to make it possible for the people of Palau to have access to their courts, whether we agree with them or not, without fear or intimidation. And if we don't, it's to this country's great shame. And this committee will not sit by and be a part of that. My colleagues and I don't want the compact to be delayed. And because of this, 36 of us have introduced the bill that we will hear testimony on today. The joint resolution introduced by Congressman DeLugo didn't change Washington's bottom line on the compact, but it did add more money to the deal, some of which would fund Palau's unfilled offices of public auditor and special prosecutor to probe allegations of corruption. It was opposed by both the Reagan and Sully administrations. I hope it is clear to everyone concerned that this bill offers the only chance of getting the compact approved by the United States, something that I would very much like to see happen very soon. 
This is not an oversight hearing into Palau's problems. But the motives of anyone who opposes a thorough investigation of Palau at this time are sus suspect. While it is very tempting for us at this time, while looking at the benefits we are so attracted to, the funds, the money, we are also fear of the consequence that can occur that may place the people of Palau in the hands of the United States for indefinite time. As far as we the people of Palau are concerned, the guiding star for all the process for the implementation and approval of the Compact of Free Association is our Constitution, the Constitution of the Republic of Palau. Then the question is, if this resolution is approved or adopted by the Congress of the United States, to us, we the Palauan, would that in any way counter to or in conflict with any provision of our Constitution? Did you support the compact implementation without the provisions of this bill? No. Would you support implementation based on this bill? Definitely, yes. Without this bill, could the people of Palau or the United States be assured of a prosecutor and auditor being in place during the life of the compact? I don't think so. I, uh, this, the Constitution has been in existence uh, since 1981, and nothing has been done with regard to this public auditor, the special prosecutor office was created some three years ago and in spite of our requests and, and you know, no, in, no enthusiasm has been shown. What I'm saying here is that having this law enacted to force Palau to have the public auditor filled because the United States want it filled, I think is a short solution to the answer. Let I me think, interrupt I right think, there. I think it's we're the not, Palau We're not people. filling this because the, the government of Palau, I mean, the, the people of the United States or the government of the United States wants it. The government of the United States is here. They're going to come in on Tuesday and oppose it. It's the people of Palau that want this, Mr. that have petitioned this committee and petitioned the government uh, of the United States to have these positions filled. Mr. Chairman, I did not say that the people of the United States want this position filled. I said if anybody wants this position filled, it's the Palauan people. Now, what I am saying here is that if the United States force us to fill them through this legislation, it is a short solution. The problem in Palau is a problem for the Palauan people to answer. They must answer their own questions. Only the Palauans, I believe, will answer their questions permanently. When we negotiated the Compact of Free Association, we negotiated it in order to meet the interests of the United States of America. We did not ask Palau for a wish list of everything they might want. They certainly provided us with one during the negotiations, but we did not ask for it because we weren't negotiating for Palau, at least those of us in the American delegation, we were negotiating for the United States. We believe that the amount of money that's in the Compact of Free Association that's guaranteed to Palau when the Compact comes into effect over the entire 50-year period of the Compact relationship is more than adequate. But tell me something. Has the administration investigated whether it was proper for a former Deputy High Commissioner of the Trust Territory and a former counsel in the office of, of uh, Micronesian status negotiations to go to work for Ipsico after leaving government? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Mr. Chairman, this whole question of uh, the contractual and employment relations that uh, Ipsico <coughs> may have had and uh, what it did and when in U.S. official involvement has been given a lot of media attention and a lot of attention here. Um, we have looked into the question of whether or not any of the information we have, I mean, <clears throat> obviously, for instance, 
our office is not an investigative office. But to, as uh, uh, in, our, in our capacities and in, in connection with our responsibilities, we have looked at the question and we're not aware of any activities by former uh, counsel to the Office for Micronesian Status Negotiations or by the uh, former Deputy High Commissioner or by anyone else, including Ambassador Zeter, that um, are in conflict with uh, the government of e uh, uh, ethics and government law. As deeply as you feel about the Pacific and the people of the Pacific and, and, and those island nations and, and all of your life blood that you put into these negotiations, when you read or you hear from a reliable source, and I would think that the, the chairman of this committee and I would think that GAO is a reliable source, that payments have been made to any number of people that you have been dealing with. And not only made to uh, uh, persons that you were negotiating with, but persons who formerly uh, worked for the federal government out there. What is your reaction? <clears throat> when you're talking about former U.S. government or trust territory officials accepting post-government service employment, in order to make any judgments about whether they acted improperly <clears throat> or properly, you need to look at the specific payments they accepted and the reasons they were accepted. I couldn't agree with you more. And what assurances are you going to give me that we're going to have such an investigation? Will the administration uh, support an independent investigation so that we can get to the facts of the, uh, the bottom of the uh, IPSCO payments and the whole IPSCO uh, operation? To the extent that evidence... You don't care? You don't, no, I certainly don't care. do care, sir. Um, you just don't care? As a, your only concern is the, is, the, uh, is the passage of the compact. You don't care what the hell goes on out there in Palau. Other than that, you don't care uh, the, fact, uh, the fact of the matter that, that uh, heads of state have received payments. You don't care that uh, there, has, there was a breakdown in law and order. From what I have heard today and what I have heard in my visit to Palau, and from all sides of the people of Palau, I am convinced that the people of Palau, all the people of Palau, want honest and democratic government. But Palau is a small community, and it is subjected to all kinds of pressures. And it is our responsibility to give them a fighting chance. Yes, we have our priorities too. The Defense Department and the State Department. All the more reason for us to do it right. Not only in Palau, but we ought to start doing it right all over the world and then perhaps we'd have less Panamas with Noriegas, less Haitis. Let's just start doing it right. No investigation, no compact, said the DeLugo bill. The probe's chief target would have been President Lazarus Sali himself. On August 20th, 1988, he was found with a bullet in his head. The official ruling, suicide. The compact's author had become another of its victims. What now for Palau? They have to give the people room to breathe. And the people themselves must uh, have the, the opportunity to see all the options. They still pressing people, they're still pushing this whole thing down into our throats. That's not fair. That's not legal. That's not moral. So the government, uh, both governments should, like uh, fishing for a big fish, should now let uh, the line go so the fish can, can 
can run for a while. And it seems that sovereignty to Palau is the their right to their land, as spelled out in their constitution. Sovereignty to Palau is their right to their territorial seas, you know. If they say we have a 200 miles limit, uh, we do have a 200 miles limit. And the sovereignty is uh, our right to define what we are and what we want to be, spelled out in our constitution. That is, sovereignty is uh, a right to be nuclear free if you choose to. Our, you know, I dream for a time where cultures can can be able to hold on to their value system inside the presence of this 20th century. And, and how do we do that? The question is, what kind of planning is necessary? And how do you engage citizens of a nation to do that kind of planning that, that I guess, enriches the whole population? And Palau is a small nation. It w you would think it would be s easy to do that, but it's evidently not when it's the Palauans who have to do it. And so they struggle to form their nationhood in the 20th century, isolated in the middle of the Pacific, but not so isolated. The trusteeship requires the United States to respect the Constitution that the people of Palau have written for themselves, even if it contains provisions that are very inconvenient for us. This obligation means that Palau can be nuclear free if it wants to, and that 75% approval of the compact must be obtained if that is what Palau's freely determined constitution requires. Brother Leon. 